Hello everyone and welcome. This is a lab walkthrough for lab H, key value in Redis. And uh, let's take a look at this lab and figure out what it takes to do this stuff in Redis. So to start, I'm going to need um, Jupyter Lab up. I'm going to need Redis Commander. Let's see what I've got in Retwist. So I've got Jupyter Lab up here. Got Retwist, got Redis, Redis Commander. Those are all running. Also need to do the Redis Cli right here. So I'll, I'll fire that up. You go there. Let's go ahead and read through the instructions. All right. For each question, include a copy of the code. Blah, blah, blah. Snapchat clone. Use Redis to create a data model like Snapchat. Basically, users send messages to each other, and once the message is accessed by the receiver, it expires in 60 seconds. The rules. Each message should be keyed by an ID. You can use an integer to control the ID yourself. Each message key should be namespaced. Each message has three fields, to, from, and text. When a user sends a message, perform these Redis commands. A new key is added to the namespace with the field set in the hash. The ID of the message goes to the inbox key. When a user reads a message, we remove it from the inbox key, first in, first out, and set the message to expire in 60 seconds. Oh, I can do this, I think. And so question number one says, use Redis Klein to send these messages in the order they are listed. Make sure to perform both steps DA and DB and sending separate commands. All right, let's give this a shot here. Might make a lot of sense if I open up side by side like this. All right, so I need to do snap. This is going to be a, a, a Redis hash. To do this, I need a Redis hash. Say uh, H set snap message one. And then I'm going to set to Bob from art text. You owe me five, you owe me $50. There you go. I wonder if history works here. No, it does not. <coughs> Pardon me. So if I do like, um, let's do keys, snap, message. All of I got one message. H get all, snap, message. One. Two Bob from Art text, you owe me $50. Cool. That's part one. The other part of sending a message is to add the ID of the message text to the user's inbox key, which is a list. For example, Mary's inbox key is snap inbox Mary. Okay, so I need to do this for uh, Bob because it's Bob's inbox. So L push snap inbox Bob. And I want to push the element 
one because that's the inbox key or that's the message ID. All right, so every one of these steps here is a two-step Redis operation. And before you freak out about that, um, just recognize that these Redis operations are, are incredibly uh, um, simple and atomic. So it should be expected that they don't take up a lot of space or time. Come on, Windows. I'm trying to get the Windows snap to do what I want. That's one. Here's the other one. Okay, that's better. Okay, now let's add the other one. So, message two. Come on, come on, keys. Don't fail me now, keys. What the heck is going on here? Who the heck knows? Clear. Message two is to Che from Bob. I gotta move my thing out of the way here. Convenient place to put that thing. From Bob, text, hello there. <clears throat> and then I want to um, L push to the inbox J message two. And then let's continue. Snap message three is to Che from Dax. Dax. Text, is this thing on? And then I need to push to Che's inbox message three. So now there's two things in Che's inbox. One thing in Bob's inbox. Okay, this one goes from Dax to Art. Message four. Dax to Art. When is the meetup? And then I need to L push into, into Dax, message four. And then I hope this is the end because I've kind of got the pattern down and I'm just bored, but there's two more, unfortunately. Message five to Che from Art. What is Bob doing? MG. Then I need to push that into Che. And then the last message, thank heavens, message six. Bob from Dax. The text is going to be who? And then I need to push into the inbox Bob message six. Okay, now let's prove that this is done. So let's do a h get all um, snap messages. I can't do it that way. Keys. And then I can do H get all snap message one, message two. Okay. 
And then if I want to see uh, the list, I could do um, L range. Um, key would be snap inbox Che. And then let's get them all. So Che has three messages in their inbox, and they are five, three, and two. So if I wanted to read one of the messages from Che's inbox, I would do an an H get all. And then the key I would use would be snap message. And then I could L pop the five. And then I would get the message. Okay, so that's how you're going to read from this little Snapchat clone. All right, let's continue on with the directions now that I've got number one working. <laughs> Using the Redis CLI, read messages from the following users in the order listed. Make sure to perform both steps E, A, and E, B. I'm going to read Bob, Che, Art, Bob. Bob, Che, Art, Bob. Man, it would be nice to be able to put it back there, wouldn't it? Be wordy. Okay, there we go. Bob, Che, Art, Bob. So to read these messages out, it says remove from the end of their inbox first. First in, first out. So if I L push, right, I want to um, R pop to get the oldest messages first. Okay, and then set the message ID to expire. And that's, I can use um, the expire. So let's do these now. Now that I've got an idea how to do that. Okay, let's R pop message, or it would be snap inbox Bob. That's going to give me the two. Oh, that, I was looking at Che's inbox, not Bob. So it gets me one, and then I can do um, expire. Assuming Bob read it, I can now expire it. Snap message one in 60 seconds. Okay. And now let's get one for Che. Okay. That was message two. Expire that one in 60 seconds. Get one for art. Art doesn't have anything in his inbox. Is that true? That is true. There's nobody in art's inbox. Nice trick question, Mike. Bob. Let's get the keys now. Still hasn't been a minute yet, huh? Surprised it hasn't been a minute. I guess I gotta wait a little longer, don't I? Oh, there we go. One of them expired. Oh, another one expired. Just waiting for that six to expire. Snapchat. Gotta wait for that minute. I guess they should have expired it in six seconds, huh? Okay, now they're expired. So I only have three messages left. So the current state of the Redis database after these operations, right, would be um, current keys under snap namespace, did that. Display messages um, which have not been read.
five, four, and three. Display the messages in each user's inbox. There's only Che and Dax that have an index, an inbox going on. That gives me Che's inbox. This gives me Dax's inbox. One message in Dax's inbox, two messages in Che's inbox. Okay, did it. Wow. All right. What else? What other challenges do I have? The Department of Motor Vehicles has hired you to build a queue management system. Uh, you have decided the best system. This is Redis. It's a good choice, by the way. The system needs to manage a single queue of users by username. The queue users can be served from one or four windows, A, B, C, or D. The structure you build in Redis should support the queue and be able to display who is waiting in the queue. As people go to the window, they should be removed from the queue and assigned to one of four windows. You should be able to display who is in each window at any time. The namespace for all keys is DMV. Users in queue. Tom, Bill, Art, Bart. Being served at Windows, Carl, Steve, Chuck, and Dave. Event. When Dave is done at Window D, Bart is served next, because he comes from the end. He gets R popped. Then I will have users in queue, Tom, Bill, and then Bart will get assigned to the Windows. Mary arrives. Mary gets put in the front of the queue. Okay, I think I got a handle on this. So the queue I'm going to manage with a list. So it's going to be DMV colon Q, and then the windows, DMV colon windows, is going to be a hash, and I'm going to have keys A, B, C, and D to represent each of the windows. Got it. Or not keys, I'm going to have fields, A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D to represent each of the windows. Okay. So it's first thing in the morning. And eight people are waiting outside the department for it to open. Add them to your queue. All right. Once again, I'm going to try and get this organized in a place with a window. I guess that's good enough. Okay, so let's do this. L push DMV Q. I'm going to push um, Amy, and then I'm going to push Beth, I'm going to push Chris, and then let's do this, L range, DMVQ. Chris, Beth, Amy. Now I wonder if I L push a bunch of them at once, what happens? Let's push D, Aaron, Fran, Greg, and Hela all in one, all in one thing. And let's see if they're in the right order. You notice how everybody's name begins with a letter of the alphabet. So it's A for Amy, B for Beth, C for Chris, D for D. That way you can see if you push them in the right order. A for Amy, Amy's first. And Hela is last. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. It worked. It worked. So you could actually just, you could have, I could have L pushed these all in one command. How sweet is that? Okay, the department is now open. Assign the first four people to windows A, B, C, and D respectively. Don't forget to remove them from the queue. Find the steps required to accomplish these tasks and then view the window. So let's do this. Let's set um, empty windows. Let's do this. H set DMV windows. 
And then we're going to have window A, and that's going to be empty. Window B is empty. Window C is empty. And window D is empty. And I'm going to do H, get all DMV windows. All the windows are empty. And let's just take a look at that queue again. I need more space. So again, let's look at the windows. Let's look at the queue. So the first thing that's going to happen is Amy got in there first. So I got to R-pop Amy and put her in A. Then I got to R-pop Beth and put Beth in B. Then I got to R-pop Chris and put Chris in C. And then R-pop D and put D in, in D. <laughs> All right, so here we go. R-pop DMV, uh, DMVQ. Now, if I want, I can pop all four at once. Amy, Chris, Amy, Beth, Chris, and D. Now, the way this would work in, you know, Python is you would execute this command in Python or Java or whatever your programming language is. And what you would get back is a list of values here. And then you would in turn send another Redis command to Redis. You would send a H set, and now you would have to manually set each of these. So Amy goes here, then Beth goes here, then Chris goes here, and then D goes here. And now when you get the queue, there's only four people waiting. And when you get the windows, Amy is served in window A, Beth is served in window B, Chris is served in window C, and D is served in, ironically, window D. Let's see what else we ask. Now the following events occur. Iris, Iris arrives. Window C becomes available. Window, woof. Let's see. Move the next person. Provide all the steps required to accomplish these steps and view the queue after all the events. All right. Let's do these one at a time. Let's do that. Iris arrives. L push. DMV. Q. Iris. Let's see what we got. Iris is now waiting. Iris is at the top of the queue. Window C becomes available. The next person from the queue to this window. H set. DMV windows C. Empty. I don't have to set it to empty. I could just set it to Aaron, but I first got to pop Aaron, right? So I got to do R pop DMVQ. Then I get Aaron. Now Aaron gets stored in Python somewhere or Java or whatever I'm using. Then I can execute this. H set window C. To Aaron. And then let's take a look at our windows. Now Aaron is in window C. Okay, now what happens? Window B becomes available. So I got a, once again, R pop. That gets me Fran. And now Fran goes to window B. Let's take a look at the queue. No more Fran in waiting. Fran is now at window B. Oh, 
Jake arrives, L push. I, I could probably have this in my history. L push, Jake. Window C becomes available. R pop. Greg? Window C, right? Okay, that's all the steps. I just did them. And then I can take a look at what we've got. Those are the windows, Amy, Fran, Greg, D. And here is the queue. Jake, Iris, Hella. That was easy. I know, I know what I'm doing. And because I know what I'm doing, it's going by rather fast. And uh, I completely get that. And I totally understand that. And that's okay. Um, you know, it's hard to know how to build the right data structures to, to implement the right application in Redis. I know this because I've been using Redis for a few years. You, if you use Redis more, you will get better at determining how to build, pick your favorite app in Redis, whether it's making a clone of Snapchat or whatever, simulating what happens at the DMV, whatever. You can see that Think about this DMV um, example. How would you implement this in a relational database? And how complicated of a relational database would that be? And for this reason, this is why Redis is a, is a really well-suited choice for implementing this type of system. Um, it has the right structures to make this manageable and also store the, the state. So if you had to recycle the Redis server, you can know that we still would know who's waiting in the queue, which is not stored in the computer's memory, it's stored in the Redis server. Okay. Make this look from a UI standpoint. Somebody leaves the DMV window, and then you push a button that says, my window's open, it turns green. And then that would send a command to the Redis server that would do this. Let's suppose your window A. No A. Then it would set it to, I don't know, empty, available. And then there could be another service that reads window A. And it, if it detects window A, B, C, or uh, D or as available, it turns a light on and the light is green. And then it can then make an announcement. It could do this. Our pop and say, Hela, please report to window A. And then when Hela arrives at window A, maybe a camera automatically detects that a person is at window A or the teller pushes a button again. And then we set window A from available to Hela. And then the dashboard could show all of the windows and show that none are available at this point. And that would also show the queue and show that the next person is Iris. We don't know what window Iris is going to, but we will when one becomes available. Okay, that's basically how you have to think about these things when you're using Redis. You solve the problem with the tools available to you you don't take um, the problem and try to model it um, to meet the relational world. You don't need to do that in Redis, and it's kind of nice. Okay, let's see what we got to do next. There's two more questions here. Are to load the infamous exam scores data set into Redis under the namespace exam scores Use Spark to demonstrate the data is there by querying it back out. Okay. Now, 
in order to load it into Redis, we're going to need some kind of key. So let's see what we got. First of all, let's load it into Spark. So I'm going to use, um, I guess what I should do is I should be consistent, right? First things first is I'm going to grab the Redis config here. Copy that. And then go here and I'll make a new lab H here. Lab H. And let me put in my header. That's going to get my Spark session set up. I'm going to run it again just to make the warnings go away. And then now I'm going to do what it asked, which is load this in. Exam scores. Spark, read, CSV. File. Oh, why is that not in the paste buffer? Let's see if this works. Right. Looks like there's a header that's missing. I think I'll use options like I showed in class. And then I'll use my quargs. I think it was um, header true. And then in first schema. I think that's the way it works. It's been a while since I've loaded a CSV in Spark. There we go. Can't teach an old dog new tricks? Who says? So there you have it. I have gotten this data loaded. And I have my column names in here. And I printed the scheme out. Let me just show what we've got. Let's do a two pandas to make it look nice and fancy. And there we go. There's all of data. Now, to load this into Redis, I want to use a hash. Now, I guess the, the way to do this is to maybe do it the wrong way first and then get us thinking about why it's the wrong way. Okay? So I guess we can start there. So if you look through the example of where we did this, you'll see that we need to use this to write it. So I'm going to copy this because I'm lazy. I shouldn't say lazy. I should say efficient because I'm efficient. And then I'm going to go back here. I'm going to paste it. And the table that we want to use is... Um, table that we want to use, we're going to call this exam scores. And then which of these columns is going to serve as the key? Now, here comes the hard part, right? Because you need to find a column. You need to find a business key in this data. Good luck. There might not be one, right? It doesn't look like there is one. Can't use class section, it repeats. Can't use exam version, it repeats. Maybe I could use the combination of exam version and class section. Maybe, I don't know. Point is, I need to come up with a key column that goes here, and I don't have one right now. So I'm kind of boned. I, I need to figure out how to find one. So let's do this, es.count, right? 65 rows in this data set. So what, is, what does ES 
select class section exam version, right? What does ES select class section exam version distinct? What does that look like? Can I do that? Is that 65? It's eight. I can't use that. That is not going to be a business key. You might say, well, well, can't I just use, you know, the student score? Again, that's arbitrary and it repeats. See that? So I can't even use that. I can't say student score. Because there's 17 of those and there's 65. All right, so what do you do? And uh, this is exactly why I did this example, because I want you to learn um, how you handle this. All right, and um, the way that I like to handle this is I like to use a window function to generate a unique ID for each row by using the window function row number, okay? There's obviously no one value or combination of these values will guarantee uniqueness. And it may be the situation that even all of the columns together aren't unique. Um, you know, like, let's just try this. Let's just do a distinct on the entire thing and see if that's 65. That might not even be 65. You're lucky, it is 65, but you're not guaranteed. You could have two students that had the exact same exam version, exact same section, exact same time to finish, and all these other things could be yeses and nos, and their score could be the same. So you can't guarantee that the row is going to be unique, so you need to generate a surrogate key. So how do you generate a surrogate key in Spark? Well, you got to use a window function. Now, I am not very keen on using the window function feature that's built into, um, into Spark data frame, so I will use Spark SQL because I know how to do window functions in SQL. So uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to register this. I'm going to say create or replace temp view, and I'm going to make a view called exam scores. All right, then I don't need to do this two pandas here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say query, and then I'm going to say Spark SQL query. And then let's just show, let's do a 2DF, two pandas. And then my query for star is going to be select everything from exam scores. So I'm just building, I'm just setting this up. So this is the exact same damn thing I just had, but now I've registered this temp view. And that will allow me to use a window function. So my window function is going to look like this. It's going to say... Let's do a select star, and then in front of that select star, let's do a um, row number over the entire data set. And let's call that as row ID. Let's see if this works. <laughs> and I think I need to sort um, to get this to work. Yeah, you need to partition by and order by in order to get this to work. So we can say over partition by everything, order by, and then I guess we could just pick a column. It doesn't really matter. So let's order by, um, let's order by, what's the first column in here? I lost it. Um, Let's take that out so I can find out what the first column was. Uh, class section. You can just order it by that. That should work. Should work. The keyword being should.
and we, it looks like we do not does not like something I'm doing. Maybe I don't need partition by because I just have order by. See, I'm a little rusty on my window functions. I think I can just do it like this. There we go. And so now I have a unique ID for each row in this data set. And that is how you generate a surrogate key via a query. So there are times when you need to do this. And this would be one of those times. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is you might not want it to start with one. So you can do road number plus, I don't know, a thousand. And then you get an error because I'm a knucklehead. I did that wrong. <laughs> it's row number. And then to that, add a thousand. And then you can get, see now they, see these, now they're just a they, thousand one, thousand two, a thousand three, a thousand four, a thousand five. So it's just another uh, technique that you can use. Now that I have this, um, if, I, if I were to take this query and put it in a data frame, like let's just call this ES2, And then I take ES2 and print schema. You can see that now I have a row ID in there. And now I can go down here and say my key column is row ID. Now I can do this. Otherwise I can't do it. And it should save. Now, before I make this work, right? Before I make this work, what I should do is show you that you need to put a key column in here. Let's take this out. Oh, what did it use for key column? Hmm, it worked. What did it use for a key column? I don't know, maybe Redis generates a key column. Hmm, maybe I didn't have to go through all this. Maybe I should have just read the docs. Let's see what it used. So let's go over to Redis. It generates a, its own hash for each one of these rows. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I just don't know. All I know is that's exactly what it did. Okay, so if I want to get one of these out, now I have to put in this massively long hash to see what it looks like. And then I can take a look at it, H get all. There is the data back out. So yes, Redis will generate a key for you, but this key has no equivalent in here. And therefore this becomes slightly problematic unless you retrieve the data immediately back out of Redis. So if I went ES2, if I went um, ES3 is going to be spark read format and then ES3, two pandas. Now you get this column. With this column. And, oh, you know, this one had row ID in it. I just didn't set that as key. 
I use the hash, and so I don't see that hash in there. But let's do this. Let's put it to exam scores two, and then let's save it differently. Save it with the key column. This. I'm just trying to show you the differences that you see in key columns. Okay, and then let's load exam scores two out. Okay, and then this says not a number. I think I need to put a key column in here. This. I need a key column here. I wonder if that's necessary. Oh, it is necessary. There you go. Okay, so now that comes back with the right with the right key column in. So you might say, well, what's the difference between the two? Right? Because you've got one like this. Let me put this in here again. You got one like this. One like this. And then I got one like this where I specify row ID as key column. Let me run it, run it. And then here's me reading the one with the key column set. Here's me reading the one without the key column set. This one doesn't have the key column set. Let's do this ES4. And you might say, well, what is the difference here? Visually, it doesn't look like any difference, right? This and this look the same. But if you go look at Redis, they're different. So let's get the keys again for exam scores. They're all hashes. The keys for exam scores too, are all my IDs that I set in Spark. So it's really up to you to decide how to do this. Do you wanna control the ID so that you know where the ID, what the ID references? Then you should create the ID in Spark. If you don't care about that, then you can do the first example here. So if I may sum up, I know this is way longer than the question really needed to be answered, but again, these are all sort of a teaching moment. So this, this is me generating an ID. Create, create your own ID. Then down here, this is me writing the table, write to Redis with Redis generating key. This one is write to Redis using specified key. And visually, they look identical. This looks the same as this one. This looks the same as above. And then this one looks the same as below. And the only difference is that they're keyed internally into Redis differently. That's it. That's all there is different about them. That was a very long answer to a very short question. Okay. In Spark SQL, read the Redis exam score data into a temp view, then get the min, max, and average exam scores across all students. Write the, the data back out to Redis as an exam score summary, and then query the data in Redis to show all the values in the hash. Okay, let's see if I can do this. So this, this example caters to the point that you cannot do certain things in Redis. Redis is great at just storing stuff, but doing analytics 
it ain't going to fly in Redis. It's really just for reading and writing things. Um, and you really can't do a lot of um, things beyond that. So let's, uh, let's do this. Get the min, max, and average exam scores for all students. I think I will do this lazily with my table that I made um, here. Although I could do it with just plain, plain old Spark. So let me do it with Spark. I guess I should. ES4.group. By, I think it's just group by everything. And then I add that um, into min. And then I, what do I want? Student score. Let's try this first. I always like to try one. Uh, and then this, I think, did I import all of these functions in? I did not. So this is not going to work. Let me just try it to show you that it won't work. Expressions should be column. Okay. So I need, I need to say um, col student score here. Or um, dot min, I think it's like that. But either way, it won't work because I don't have col defined. So I will need to import those functions from PySpark. Import uh, from PySpark SQL functions. Import everything. Just be lazy. Okay, and then I think it's min min col like that. I think it's like that. It's been a while. There we go. So that's the worst score that someone got. And I guess I could alias that. Take that and dot alias that as min score. And then while I'm at it, I could have done this in Spark SQL, but I like to try things different ways. Let's do the max and the average min average max. Some commas in here. Like this. And then I need to fix these. Min, average, max. There you go. Min score, average score, max score. And then I want to take that and I don't want to show it. I want to write it. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'll put it in a variable. Let's call it ES summary. And let's do this. Let's do let's go pick our um, our code up from up here. And we'll use this approach with no row ID with no uh, key column. Nope. No wonder why they look the same. Hold on a second. Oh, wait, that one was right. I'm just being a knucklehead. Never mind. Why am I looking at that? Don't screw around with that, Mike. Uh, what you want is this part. Okay. And I'm going to go down here, and we are going to take ES summary, and we are going to write it, and we are going to put it in the table exam summary. Done. Now I go over to the command line and let's get the keys for exam summary. There's one key. And I can do a h get all. And get that, and then I have a dashboard of the exam summary, like that. 
Ta-da! Min score 13, max score 30, average score 22.73. Mission accomplished. Last one is done right here. Let's be doing it. So what do you need to know about Redis and Spark? Uh, let me sum that up because I might have confused you as I was doing it. Basically, when you write to Redis, if you do not include a key column, it will generate a hash for you, a unique ID for each row. When you read the data back out, you won't see that key column. Unless when you read it back out, you include the key column. Okay. If I want to see the hash, if I want to see the hash, I can do that. I just have to give it a name. So Okay, let me do this. This one, this reads the hash. So I'm gonna call this row hash. Whoop. Row hash. And exam scores one is the one that had, exam scores the one with the hash. Let's see, do I have the row hash in here somewhere? Don't see it in here. Maybe it's just ID. Interesting. I guess I can't pull that out. I assume it was in that exam scores, right? Yeah, I can't. I can't seem to pull those out. Interesting. Should be able to yank those out. Or maybe it's just key. Let's see, you know how it works with these keyword args. And now I should probably go read the docs. Yeah, I'm out here at the docs that are over in Blackboard. And um, it says key column when reading specifies the column name to store the hash key. So that should bring in um, that hash key. Not sure what the deal is there. Let me give it one last, last college try. So exam scores is the one that has a hash key. See that? So if I just said, you know, hash key, that should it label a column in there hash. I wonder, let's see, let's do a print schema. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. It's not bringing in that um, column called hash. Weird. Should be doing that. Should be doing that. Um, if I do this with exam scores too, It still brings them in, but I still don't see that. And I go um, row ID. Nothing changes. It's interesting. Yeah, it's just not seem to be doing what the docs say it's supposed to do, which is what's throwing me off. But welcome to the world of big data, you know, where things are not always as consistent as they should be. It's very bizarre. It was that key, hold on, I had the wrong uh, column in there. Key column, that could make a difference, key dot column. No, it still, it still doesn't change a thing, key column. Yeah. Oh, well, not, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, just something to note that um, if it's a hash key, you, you can't seem to pull that back out um, in Spark for whatever reason, I can't. I, I should be able to call this whatever I want. You know, it, it, it should pull it back out, but it does not. It only does it when it's row ID. Uh, then it seems to do it um, because row ID is an explicit key that I set when I did exam scores two. Right? I set that key. 
rather than let Redis. So if you set the key, you can get it back out. If Redis sets the key, you can't get it back out, Spark. At least not the way I'm trying to do it. Okay. So uh, that's it. That's the homework. I did all the little bits of it. Um, I did even this part where I did some analytics and then put the analytics right back um, in Redis. So this is a good example of, you know, you can't do everything in Redis. It doesn't let you do counts, mins, averages. And so you have to do those in another system and then write those back to Redis.